Welcome everybody to the University of Applied Research and Development's podcast for emergency response and risk management. We are delighted to be here with Michael Boardman, who is an expert in business continuity, planning and deployment. So we'd love to spend some time with him this evening. Welcome, Michael. Well, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Look, we'd love to hear from you about your career, how you've got to be where you are, what you do in your role at the moment with your specialist team. So please let us know how you got to be where you are today. Sure. Uh, so our, our company actually formed uh, based on our American Red Cross roots. Uh, we have a lot of uh, members of our leadership team who believed in the mission of saving lives as, as a result of being a part of this wonderful nonprofit uh, uh, international organization. And we realized that there was an opportunity uh, outside of the nonprofit realm where we wanted to form a company that actually focuses on uh, providing health, safety, preparedness, business continuity solutions for uh, essentially large corporations. Uh, we, uh, we decided that we wanted to focus on healthcare because what we learned is that there's, and for anyone who's been in the business continuity business, they know for the most part, there's only two reasons why companies really invest in uh, emergency preparedness or business continuity. One is that they've already had a negative event that they don't want to repeat, or they're regulated and, and mandated to actually have some type of a, uh, an active emergency preparedness plan in place. So when we formed our company, we realized that we needed to uh, focus, and because I have healthcare experience, I've been in healthcare the last few years, we decided that we really wanted to focus here in the United States on what is the CMS emergency preparedness rule, which is uh, dictated by Medicare and Medicaid um, here in the States. And it really requires healthcare organizations across the country to be able to comply to a number of uh, stipulations within that rule to make sure they're able to protect their facilities, their employees, their patients and their residents in long-term care facilities. Uh, the pandemic has been a real challenge here in the United States. Uh, as you've seen in the news, we, we've had uh, more reported cases than, than any, any other country in, in the world at this point. And long-term care facilities have been hit pretty hard here in the States. So Unfortunately, I think for many of us, be, being in shelter-in-place mode, uh, that uh, business has essentially halted. But we are uh, prepared at this point uh, to uh, advise companies on how to reopen safely. Uh, and that is happening slowly here in the United States. And our commitment uh, is, is never compromised as far as making sure that we are empowering people to be able to look out for each other, uh, and uh, be prepared to respond to any emergency, whether it's a pandemic, an active shooter, whatever the case might be. So our focus really right now is on healthcare. And so your partners that you work with, they're from the Red Cross organization as well, is that where you yes. all meet? Okay. Yes, uh, we have a Red Crossers, a former Red Crossers, and also some former uh, military folks who, who have uh, a great deal of experience in uh, emergency preparedness. And uh, we have uh, formed uh, national partnerships with uh, healthcare associations like the American uh, College of Healthcare Administrators with thousands of members uh, across the United States. Uh, we also have formed, uh, we're actually uh, developing a center of excellence program uh, with the Center for Improvement of Healthcare Quality out of Texas. And we're focused on creating a, a program where a healthcare organization can actually have a badge online indicating that they are emergency preparedness certified and that they are a center of excellence uh, in this space, which we believe is going to position specific healthcare organizations as being a, a stronger brand and commitment to the culture of their companies by investing in uh, more of their resources into emergency preparedness overall. So do you believe that culture is really important and an important part of preparedness, considering you've got a group of people coming from a similar background as yourself? Without question. Uh, that, that, I think that's the greatest challenge we face is uh, talking with uh, C-suite leaders and indicating the fact that emergency preparedness is not a transactional experience 
where uh, I think for the most part, and, and I hate to say this, but I, I believe it's true. There's a lot of organizations, not just in healthcare, where they just hope or believe it's not going to happen to them, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's wildfires, whether it's volcanoes, whatever the case might be, they just hope it circumvents them so they don't have to deal with it directly. And then once it does hit them and they end up uh, having to close facilities, then uh, it becomes a major issue. So uh, making it a, a cultural investment where uh, healthcare organizations and companies overall uh, openly invest in the safety and, and preparedness of their employees and their patients just improves the overall uh, culture of quality and commitment uh, uh, to, their enter- to their enterprise. So when you work with an organization outside of, outside of this type of situation we're in right now, when we return to a new normal, what sort of areas do you, do you look at with uh, corporations in terms of business continuity? What, what's on your hit list? Well, really, uh, it, it, it really varies uh, depending on the needs of a particular organization. Uh, we, we really try and listen to our uh, prospects, our clients, our partners, as far as what they're facing today. For example, uh, with, the, with the current pandemic, uh, we've realized, and I think healthcare organizations have realized, that their supply chain uh, failed them in many ways not having the uh, protective equipment that they needed, uh, uh, just a a number of resources, whether it's, um, oh my God, there's just so, uh, uh, ventilators is another example where the supply chain completely failed them during the pandemic. So we actually believe that we're positioning ourselves right now as we advise companies on how to safely reopen. I think the next step after we have them open and fully functional in our new reality is really evaluating their supply chains and how we can improve that process for them in the future. Okay. And do you tend to, within your own, your own organization, do you tend to split up different markets, different areas, different competencies between you, between your skill sets? How does that work? Yeah, we, we really do. We try, uh, with our team, we try and focus on our strengths uh, individually as, as uh, our leadership team is currently comprised. So we, we, have, uh, we have folks that are really uh, very strong in, in policy and procedure and actually building a business continuity plan for a client. We, uh, we, we also have uh, strategic partnerships that I think are critically important to us uh, that provides us or positions us as a full service business continuity company. So we have partnerships with a, a company that offers emergency mobile services. So uh, there's the old days of having the manual with everyone's uh, contact information, their cell phone numbers and somebody sitting at a desk you know, uh, dialing all of the, uh, the the key leaders during an emergency, we're we're trying to eliminate all of that at this point and really focusing on on uh, not only uh, mobile communications but also cybersecurity solutions. Uh, we've also uh, aligned or partnered recently with an events company that actually builds uh, temporary shelters for like Coachella and major arts events. They actually. They pivoted, and we were working with them to build temporary medical shelters in order to uh, be able to segregate uh, COVID-19 patients from regular hospital uh, uh, visitors. So that's been, uh, that's been very important to us. So between our management team and our partnerships, that's critically important. I apologize for my dogs. Is there someone at the door you need to go and check or something? No, bear, bear with me for just a second, please. Sorry. Sorry about that, Craig. No problem. <laughs> Completely understand. Yes. So one of the things that I really love to ask is for our students who come from an oil and gas industry or for people that are new to the sector and they're studying this emergency response and risk management for the first time, what do you think are some really valuable experiences that people should do early on in their career or in a transition to make sure they're prepared to go into a wider industry? 
I, I think it's really just a, a, aligning either with an individual or uh, a group that's uh, well-versed in uh, business continuity solutions and learn as much as they can uh, about the business or the space that they're in. Um, we we uh, don't currently uh, work specifically with oil and gas companies, but we've recently formed a partnership with uh, Trinidad, uh, Tobago, AmCham, and they have oil and gas uh, clients and members within their group. But to answer your question uh, directly, it's really a matter of just being on the front lines, gaining as much experience as you can as far as actually uh, being involved in a, in a negative event, uh, volunteering your time, whatever, whatever you need to do to gain the experience necessary to be able to respond to an emergency. Okay. Tell us about an experience that was challenging for you in the past where you've had to bring your skills into play. Yeah, you know, a, a member of my team would probably be uh, better served to answer that question, but it, it's really a, a matter of uh, when we've had uh, hurricanes in the past here in the United States, uh, not having the resources ready to go to respond to specific geographic areas. Uh, a case in point, it, it's, it's less associated with a direct experience that I've had, uh, but uh, one element uh, involving a client of ours in healthcare is they literally had a facility that was shut down due to Hurricane Michael last year. And they were actually putting uh, long term care residents uh, at risk. They realized that they were not prepared to respond and evacuate uh, their patients and long term care uh, residents. And we uh, realized that we needed to engage with them and, and completely revamp their emergency preparedness plans to uh, respond appropriately in the future. And they literally were hit with a tornado the last time we met with them. So we had to add a uh, tornado uh, response protocol uh, to their overall emergency preparedness plans. So there's always, there's always something happening where the, we need to be able to uh, guide a client to uh, be prepared for the next event. Right. Just one more question, um, because you're working with such a range of different strategic partners and what you're doing now with healthcare, I would imagine. Tell us about technology and the role that technology is playing in response and preparedness in this industry. Yeah, without question. Again, our, our recent partnership with a, a mobile emergency safety company that's uh, really big in this uh, academia uh, space, uh, as well as in healthcare, uh, just being able to embrace uh, being able to be as flexible and streamlined as possible, in, especially in your communication uh, protocol during an emergency. Uh, having a mobile communications during a, a hurricane event is absolutely essential. And we realized that we needed to add that technology to our, our toolkit. Uh, so having a Rave as a partner with us allows us to incorporate more and more technology into how uh, a client responds to a particular event. Rave, R-A-V-E? R-A-V-E, uh, Rave Mobile Safety. Uh, they're actually uh, right down the road from us. They're based out of Boston, uh, and they, uh, they have a, a, nat uh, a national reach uh, with several industries, including healthcare with us. Okay. So, Michael, going forward then, you know, you, you seem to be expanding and partnering, and I know you're, you're focused on the health healthcare industry. So where do you see are the biggest gaps, biggest weaknesses? You just, before we started recording, you're talking about the experience happening now in the States and what's yes. happening, I was talking about happening here in Indonesia. Where do you think the recurring biggest gaps are in a nation's ability to respond to something like the pandemic that we have right now? Uh, interestingly, uh, talking with a lot of healthcare leaders and, and actually a lot of nurses who have been on the front lines during the pandemic here in the United States, we're, we're going to have a significant shift in uh, how healthcare looks over the next, uh, I would say, six to 12 months. Uh, I actually spoke with a, a, a leader of nurses in Connecticut uh, last week. And she said that one of the most dangerous 
aspects of the pandemic has been the fact that leadership has been disconnected with the front lines. And what she meant by that is when the pandemic hit, uh, there was a, a definitely a consensus that there was uh, a, a failure to respond uh, quickly and appropriately to the pandemic, uh, which put a, a lot of clinical folks at risk, as well as patients and uh, residents of long-term care facilities. And what, what I've learned in my interviews over the last few weeks is that we are going to have a lot of senior uh, nurse managers and nurses, uh, veteran experienced uh, clinical leaders who are going to leave healthcare. They're going to retire early because of how poorly uh, healthcare leadership responded to the pandemic. There's also a lot of new nurses coming on board who are going to see a new reality on how hospitals operate moving forward, where it's gonna be a little more challenging, complex, and tedious to be prepared and safe uh, within uh, the healthcare environment, where I think it's going to take a significant toll on healthcare staffing and uh, coverage in the future. So does that mean there's an opportunity for you? I think there is an opportunity for us. We're still identifying what that key opportunity is. Uh, we, we're looking to possibly be a resource, again, as far as coaching uh, healthcare organizations and other companies on how to safely reopen and then take care of their employees in the future. Uh, so that's something we're, we're currently evaluating. I was on an interesting webinar yesterday, um, and John Caffin, um, from the United States Forest Service, very senior person. He was saying that, and Dr. Bill Patton as well from the UN, Dr. Bill Patton, they were both agreeing that the non-health consequences and impacts are far greater than the health impacts when it is a pandemic like this because of the economic um, implications of working from home or closing businesses, schools, the lost the lost graduations, the lost academic completions. Yes. Those sorts of things are, even though the loss of life is tragic, the non-health consequences or impacts are, are bigger and more important and more consequential in the longer term. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. I, I don't think we have a clear picture of, of what our future looks like post-pandemic. Uh, I, I think... Uh, for the most part, worldwide, we're going to have a new reality. And, and I don't think any of us are very clear on what that looks like. You know, we're, we're, we're in a very strange place in the United States and the fact that uh, the federal government has, has kind of uh, succeeded to the state governors and leaderships uh, within the, the, the state government uh, organizations to make their own decisions on how they want to reopen. And I think that's a very dangerous uh, way to go because, I, you know, we're, we're seeing an uptick in states that are starting to reopen businesses in new cases that are, are coming up with the pandemic and COVID-19. So I, I'm, I'm definitely concerned on how long this is going to continue, how many resurgences we may have in the United States. And uh, I think we're all prepared for what could be a very new normal for us. And we have no idea what that looks like. Right. I was on a webinar last night just talking about digital transformation and the new normal using those exact yeah. words. And it will never be the same. There has to be a new normal and we need to be ready for that. Do you have without any final question. Pardon me? Oh, without question. All right. Do you have any final thoughts for our, our students that are going to be watching this case study and just listening to what you do and how you do it? And what sort of words would you say to them as they're contemplating where to from here after I finish my degree? Uh, I think they've made a great choice in careers. Uh, it, based on the numbers that we're seeing worldwide, we're looking at a, a and I hate to say this, because we're, we're seeing uh, the cost of natural disasters increasing by easily 6% a year. And we're, we're looking at a, a, a global issue, whether it's uh, climate change, whether it's you know, uh, other factors that are dictating uh, these natural disasters and also workplace violence and active shooters. This is, this is a tremendous uh, uh, career choice for people who are uh, looking to make the world a safer place. 
And uh, I, I am I applaud the folks that are are getting their degrees uh, in this discipline. And uh, you know, I, I would love to be a resource. However, uh, our team and our company can be a resource uh, for your students. Uh, we'd be happy to support and help them however we can. Michael, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yes, Craig, thank you. It's my pleasure.